Well, good morning. Good morning. We are so glad that you've joined us here at First Mansfield. Uh, if you could come in, take a seat. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us. You've chose to worship with us this morning. My name is Zach Shelton. I have the privilege of serving as the family minister here at First Mansfield. And if you are a guest, we are especially glad that you have joined us today. We'd love it if you'd fill out one of the Connect cards. You can find those in the seat back pocket right in front of you. Fill one of those out, and at the end of the service, we'd love to connect with you at our Next Steps corner at the back of the worship center. We have leaders there who would love to get to know you and talk to you and know how we can help you take your next step. Our mission here at First Mansfield is guiding people to multiplying impact for Christ's kingdom. And a part of that mission is helping people take their next step. So if you have questions about baptism or membership or how to get involved and serve in our church, or maybe even you have questions about what it means to follow Jesus, we would love to talk with you at our Next Steps Corner at the back of the Worship Center after our service. And you can fill out one of those Connect cards as well if you'd like to and take that there at the end of the service. Uh, well, summer is quickly approaching. I can't believe it. I don't know if you can, but summer is coming very fast. And a part of summer is Vacation Bible School. So if you uh, have a child that is a four-year-old through completed sixth grade, we would love for them to come. It's going to be June 3rd through the 6th from 9 to noon, uh, it's Monday through Thursday. It's going to be a great week at Breaker Rock Beach. And if you'd like to serve, we would love for you to jump in and serve there are lots of great ways to get plugged in, whether it's as a teacher or in crafts or many other areas. And so if you'd like to serve, you can scan that QR code and uh, jump in with us June 3rd through the 6th for Vacation Bible School. But as we prepare to worship the Lord together this morning, I'm going to be reading Psalm 34. So if you would, let's stand together as we hear God calls to worship through his word from Psalm 34. This is what the word of the Lord says. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is a person who takes refuge in him. Would you join us as we turn our eyes to the Lord? Would you sing this with us? Sing, you make it easy. You make it easy to love you. You are good and you are kind. You bring joy into my life. We trust him. You make it easy to trust you. He's never left. You have never left my side been faithful every time and all I want is you Jesus all I want is you he's our refuge because you are the refuge I run to you are the fire that leads me through the night I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear for you are by my side. I'll follow you anywhere. Oh, Jesus, you came to my rescue. Took my place upon that cross. You redeemed what I had lost. Now my whole world revolving around you. He's the center of our lives. You're the center of my life. You're the treasure. You're the prize. And all I want is 
Jesus, all I want is you. Oh, you are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear for you are by my side. I'll follow you anywhere. Follow you anywhere. Follow you anywhere. We make this our prayer wherever he leads. And where And all I want is you, Jesus, all I want is you. Make that your prayer. Wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, all I want is you, Jesus, all I want is you. All I want is you, oh, is you are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you, nothing to fear for you. I'll follow you anywhere. Amen. Can we celebrate our refuge? with us we sing of God's grace the grace of God is reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on this solid ground the Lord is my salvation Him, there's nothing to fear. I will not fear when darkness falls. His strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. We declare this who is like our God. Who is like the Lord, our God, strong to save, faithful in love? And my debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. hope is hidden in him. My hope is hidden in the Lord. He flowers each promise of his word. When 
to fate, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. Is who is like the Lord our God? He's strong to save, faithful in love. My debt is paid, and the faith. In times of waiting, times of need, when I know lost, when I am weak, I know his grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. And when I reach the final day, he will not leave me in the grave. That's right. But I will rise. He will call. time let your voices declare this is who is like the lord our god is strong to save faithful in love my debt is paid and the victory won the lord is my salvation the Lord is my salvation. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I have have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. I power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. We think of this, and when I think that God is son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, in my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. So we sing, then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. 
time. Let your voices, we declare that. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to how great thou art, how great thou art. Father, we acknowledge your greatness together, beholding your power and your majesty. Lord, I pray that you would just give us fresh eyes to see that this morning and to reflect on this truth. And as we just continue in our worship together, God, would you consume our hearts and our minds, would you open our minds and our eyes to see you clearly today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to worship, would you take a seat where you are as we declare this truth that we believe together. Would you join us as we share this statement of faith together? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born from the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and on the third day rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and eternal life. Amen. We've spent time this morning beholding God's greatness and power and majesty. And what we know to be true is as we behold God for who he is, we see ourselves for who we are. And we see our sin for what it is. And so we want to take a moment in our service today to humble ourselves before the Lord, confessing our need for him as we confess our sin to him. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if you could in this moment, just bow your heads and close your eyes. And just in the stillness of this moment before the Lord, would you begin to ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate and open your eyes to see areas of sin in your life, these things that are left unconfessed. Maybe it's through words that you've spoken today Maybe it's through an attitude of self-sufficiency. Maybe it's idolatry of, uh, of perfection and control or in worldly pleasures. You're just seeking after things that aren't Jesus, whatever that may be. Would you just begin to take this moment to confess those things before the Lord? Almighty Father, we come before you humbled, declaring our desperate need for you. Every moment and every hour, Jesus, we need you. We confess together with one voice, Lord, that we have not loved you as we should. We've given our affections and our attention to things that aren't you. We have fought and, and been striving for um, control and, and perfection and, and pleasing others and seeking after the things that the world can offer us, deceiving ourselves to think that it could satisfy us when you are the only one who can. I just pray, Lord, in this moment, that as we confess our sin before you, have mercy on us. And in this moment, Jesus, would you remind us that the forgiveness we have in you 
as we've sung and declared your greatness, as we think of your sacrifice on the cross. Jesus, would you breathe fresh life into our lungs, drawing our attention and our gaze off of the things that we have been distracted by and fix our eyes on you and you alone. God, would you remind us of the assurance and the hope that we have in Christ, that there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. No matter how many times we fall, no matter how many times we slip and stumble, you remain faithful. And so even when we are faithless, Lord, would you remain faithful and remind us of that truth today. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for our hope in Christ. And may we dwell on that and think on that as we continue in our worship together. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Receive these words of assurance from the Lord that comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Listen to verse five. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So as we continue to sing, would you just remain where you are for a moment, reflecting on these words and this truth, and we'll invite you to stand. Would you continue to worship with us? that victory together. There is a light, salvation's flame, Christ undefeated, he trampled the grave. See now the cross be lifted high, the light has come, the light is won, behold the Christ. We sing this hope. Hope has a name, his name is Jesus, my Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name, his name is Jesus, oh Christ be praised, I have victory. Sing this hope. There'll be a day, my hope complete. Now, home and glory, your face I'll see. And my pain no more, and my fear will cease. I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ, my King. Oh, I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ, my King. Let's fix our eyes on him as we declare this together. And hope has a name, his name is Jesus, my Savior's cross. sinner free hope has a name his name is jesus oh christ be 
praise. I have victory. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. My Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised. I have victory. Oh, Christ be praised. I have victory. Amen. Can we celebrate that victory? Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning, First Mansfield. How are we doing today? Some people are really excited. Some of you are. <laughs> like, yeah, it's all right. My name is Madison Grace. I'm one of the elders here. And it's, it's my privilege to um, come to you this morning, give you an update. Our pastor, Spencer, and, and Ryan, and our team, they are safely on the field um, in Georgia. That's not in the United States. They've gone over to the other Georgia, and they are, are serving there. Spencer's already spoken this morning, taught some biblical theology. They sang together. They're having a blast. So we need to make sure that we're in prayer for our team. Because here at First Mansfield, our strategy is to worship. That's what we're doing today. We're going to belong. That's where our life groups are for. And to go. All of us are called to go. And one of the things that we put before you is that in the next two years, we hope that every member here has the opportunity to go, to go on mission. Maybe it's to travel to the other side of the world. Maybe it's to travel to Fort Worth, Texas and engage in the lost that are there. But we have the ability to leave this building, to be commissioned and go forth to take the great commission to the uttermost. So please be in prayer for Spencer and Ryan and team as they are working um, and please be uh, praying about what you can do and where God's leading you. It may just be your neighbor next door. It may be someone halfway across the world. But we are called to take the Great Commission to the uttermost. Let's pray for them right now. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ability we have to partner together, not just to give financially for the sake of missions, but to actually engage bodily as we go forward showing the glories of your great kingdom to this lost and dying world. And we pray for our pastor and team as they are leading out. We pray for their safety. But more than that, Father, we pray for boldness in proclaiming the gospel, encouraging believers, and making your name famous. In your name we pray. Amen. Also this morning, it is one of our equipping Sundays. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you my friend, Dr. Travis Dickinson. And so we, we've had Dr. Dickinson here before. He's spoken to us, but I will read from his Wikipedia page to let you know who he is. <laughs> Travis Dickinson was born 19th of March, 1988, as an English boxer who fights in the light heavyweight division. <laughs> okay, that's not true. Um, so as I tell my students, don't trust in, in Wikipedia. Uh, now, actually, Dr. Dickinson's a, a longtime friend. Uh, he used to teach at Southwestern Seminary, now teaches at Dallas Baptist University. He is a smart guy. How do I know that? Because he has a lot of degrees. He does BA at Alaska Bible College. He did two MAs uh, in California, one at Biola and one at Talbot. He did another MA at Iowa, Univ University of Iowa, where he also did his PhD. He is a smart guy. But don't let that uh, keep you from listening to him because he is also, <laughs> I know sometimes you think, oh yeah, professors, tune out, pay attention to something else. Uh, he's down to earth. He, he cares about the kingdom. He cares about the gospel. He cares about us thinking better about God. And maybe you've seen his, his blog or his website where he talks a lot about doubt. He talks about apologetics, talks about philosophy, but he really wants us to, to engage God where we're at and to, and to help us to learn more. Um, he has a wonderful family, four children. His wonderful wife is here with us today. If you get a chance to meet Sherry, uh, you will find that this family is just phenomenal and they are uh, going to bless our souls today as we talk about an important subject in apologetics called the problem of evil. 
that all of us have dealt with at some time or another. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen, period? How do we deal with that in a world where we have a good God? Questions like that come to mind. And so the, the next couple of hours, we're going to be spending time together thinking about these things. Dr. Dickinson's going to speak in a worship time together. And then when we're through with that, we'll move over to the gym. We'll have a Q&A time about the questions that we have with the, the problem of evil. But we do need to turn to the, to the word because we can talk about ideas and concepts and philosophies all day long. But as Christians, what we believe about all those things are rooted in the word of God. So, so if you will, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're going to be reading verses 18 through 28. If you have a children, if you have one of the Bibles we've given you, that is page 1,252. So as you get there, when you get there, if you would, stand in honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. Romans 8, verses 18 through 28. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to the decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the spirit as the first fruits. We also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is not, hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we pray in this moment now that we can hear from your word, that we can be transformed by your word, and that we can act upon your word. We need your help through the power of the Spirit. We pray for Dr. Dickinson as he comes to speak that you would help him pierce our hearts with the truth that comes from your word. And we can go out of here more conformed to your image and more prepared to do your work. In your name we pray. Amen. Yes, there is another Travis Dickinson, and he is a boxer in the UK, and we've been competing for URLs and websites and email addresses ever since I started getting into these things. Uh, it is wonderful to be with you. It's such an honor and a privilege. I, I, I love this church. I, I love uh, people that are here, of course. I, I care about people that are here, uh, but I love what, this, what you guys are doing, what this church is doing, what you're about. Uh, I don't know if this sounds like a compliment, but this is a very big compliment. It feels very familiar when I come here. Uh, and it's just an honor to be invited back. That means a lot to me, honestly. Uh, and here's what I love. I, I was invited to come speak, uh, right, First Baptist Mansfield, and asked to talk about the problem of evil. <laughs> like, I just love that. I think that's awesome, right? There is a uh, few objections and concerns and worries that, that lead people to deny God, deny their Christian beliefs more than uh, the problem of evil. Right, this is the big one. This is, this is the one that people struggle with uh, in some ways more than any others. Um, 
And so it's important to us. And again, like it's an awesome thing. Let's do this. Let's, let's lean into this as a church and let's think about these things because we need to know what to say. We need to know how to think. But here's the thing, right? We're all going to experience this. We're all going to experience those moments in which life gets really difficult and life gets really tragic in a way, um, right? It's, it's coming for us. And, and, and a room this size already, you, you, some of you probably barely made it here this morning because of the difficulties of life, because of the trials you're going through. And we need to have answers to this. We need to sort of figure out how to think about, right? One of the things I, I say to my students often is that what we don't often think about is a theology of suffering, how to think theologically about the difficulties of life, and that's really what we want to do this morning. Um, for many, the world is so difficult, right? And, and I'm gonna put some images up here on the screen. Some of, some of them are a little disturbing, but right, we gotta, we gotta face these things in some ways. For many, the world seems godless. And I, and I think we can understand that. Like, I think when, when you look out at the world and you see so much evil, so much pain and suffering, so much difficulty, so many trials, and again, it affects all of us in various ways, I can see, I can relate, right? I can understand why someone might look at the world and see it as somewhat godless, right? Why this is such a problem for many people. And, and there's so many things we could have, uh, so many images I could have put up there, up here, uh, so many uh, instances we can look at. I've just gathered a few. Unfortunately, it's quite easy to do. So in 2017, uh, there was a shooting. It's, it's considered the worst shooting in modern uh, American history. Happened in Las Vegas, you, you might remember this, where uh, the gunman got onto the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino and opened fire into a sea of people below him. What's a little crazy about this, and one reason why it sort of sticks in my mind a little bit is because uh, we don't know why. We really don't know a, a motive for why he did what he did, uh, but he was methodical. He researched locations, he researched events, uh, he even researched what the best uh, uh, floor of the hotel would be to inflict the most amount of carnage. 58 people uh, were killed and 800 were, were injured that day. This next image is disturbing for sure. Uh, it's a famous image, you've, you've maybe seen it before, uh, it, it was published in the New York Times in 1993 by a guy named Kevin Carter, a uh, photojournalist in the Sudan, who was working in the Sudan. Um, and this is a little girl. This is a little girl who's trying to get to her parents, who are, and her parents are at a United Nations feeding center. And she's obviously struggling. And of course, what we see in the background is a vulture who is uh, there watching and waiting. Uh, Kevin Carter was asked, like, what did you do next? You know, what, after you snap the picture, okay, uh, there was lots of questions. He was questioned pretty hard on, on some of these things. And he said he, he tried to, you know, he shoot away the vulture. And, uh, but there was nothing. There was this, this little girl was representative of hundreds of individuals who were in deep, deep trouble. And there was nothing he could do. He's helpless. Uh, Kevin Carter actually won the Pulitzer Prize for this photo. Uh, and later that year, he committed suicide. He, could, he couldn't come to grips with all that he had seen. Uh, we, we might remember in 2004 in the Indian Ocean, the tsunami that hit. This was the third, this is the result of the third largest earthquake in recorded history. Uh, even the aftershocks were bigger earthquakes that, that often would cause much destruction. Uh, nearly a quarter of a million people died as a result of this tsunami. Uh, the next image is his Chase. Uh, he was featured in Christianity Today. Uh, Chase had an aggressive and rare cancer. I'm not even seeing it. I, I, I'm always brought to emotion when I see it because his face is just so innocent, right? And he's, he has brain cancer. Um, he suffered horribly. Now, this, there is some good news. Chase sur survived his cancer, uh, but, but very many do not. All right. And then this last image, right, this little guy uh, 
right? Brought the world to its knees, um, caused, or at least related to the deaths of upwards to 7 million people. Now, the question is always why, right? Why, why God? Why, why do you allow this? God, why, why is there so much? But I actually think the question oftentimes too is, how could you, God? How could you allow what you allow? Here, here's the tension that I think leads people to um, struggle with their belief in a good and all-powerful God. Here, here it comes. Here's the tension. God could have easily, in his power, stopped all of those things without any, you know, real effort, no sweat for God, right? Whatever, I don't know what that means for God. God doesn't sweat. But, right, whatever that means, like easy for God uh, to have prevented or eliminated all of those things, right? No exercise of his power. And here's the real kicker in a way, if God is good, then we think he ought to have, right? You think of yourself as a parent with your own kids, Or it doesn't have to be your own kids, but when you see somebody in suffering and you could easily prevent them from suffering, you do that. Why? Because you're a good person, right? The the goodness in us drives us to say we ought to, right, help as we can, and God could help in all of these things. He could eradicate all of these things. And that's the real tension that we we feel is that if there's an all-good, all-powerful God... Right? then there shouldn't be any evil. But I, I wouldn't recommend denying evil. <laughs> like one of these things seems in the tension seems to have to go, and I wouldn't recommend denying evil. I mean, there are traditions that are out there that deny the existence of evil, right? And they say it's just a kind of illusory sort of thing, and you can free your mind from understanding these things and so on. I just have never understood how that goes in, say, the counseling room, right? I know you just went through this terrible tragedy, but don't worry, it's, it's just an illusion, Right? I don't, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, satisfy me. So I don't recommend denying evil. And by the way, the Bible doesn't deny evil. We're going to see that the Bible actually tells us a story about evil and understands it, understands it into a, a broader framework. But that's the tension, right? It's either that God has to go or evil has to go, but how can we deny evil? How can we deny the reality that people suffer and die? I mean, just, those are just a handful of, of images, and we could go on all day, right? All you gotta do is flip on the evening news tonight, and you're gonna see many, many examples of the existence and reality of evil. And that's why people faced with that choice sometimes deny the existence of God. But I think that's a matter of theology, right? Dr. Grace will be happy to know that I think the whole issue comes down to how we think theologically about evil, and God, of course, right? How, how we think about this relationship. Um, having good theology is the way to resolve the problem of evil. Amen? Right, you ready for that? Here we go. So David Hume puts the objection this way. He says, is he willing to prevent evil but not able? Well, then he's impotent, right? He's not all-powerful. Is he able but not willing? Then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Well, whence then is evil, right? How do we explain evil? Now, I don't suggest we give up on any of those characteristics. I, I, I don't suggest we think that God isn't good, and I don't suggest that we think that God isn't all-powerful. Here's, here's our way to go. Our way to go is to argue, is to see God as having good and justifying reasons For every incident, every ounce of evil, God has good and justifying reasons uh, for allowing the evil. And I think that's really important to say that, that God allows evil, that he doesn't do evil, of course, right? He allows evil. How could he allow evil? Well, for good and justifying reasons, uh, think of this. Okay, so I've taught all four of my kids, right? They're all older, I mean, a bit older now. They're, they're, we've got one preteen and, and three teenagers. Um, so pray for us. No, uh, right? We, <laughs> I taught each of my four kids to ride a bike, right? 
And I'm sure there was probably better methodologies to this, but my methodology was to, you know, pop off the, the training wheels, hold on to their, uh, uh, you know, handlebar, and basically run like a fool down the street. Running like a fool because, you know, the kids at that age have one speed, and it's max. Okay, so their little feet just go, and I'm running down the street like a fool, and at some point, I have to let go. Right, and notice what that allows. It allows for the possibility, and it happened with all four of them, that they tipped over at some point, got a little scraped knee, scraped elbow, you know, a bruise or something like that. But does that make me a bad father? I want to suggest that no, right? Because I had good and justifying reasons. It's a great good. I mean, for a kid, like, this is awesome to learn to ride a bicycle, right? It's freedom, a little bit of freedom. Uh, They can just ride around the neighborhood all of a sudden, and it's pretty awesome. So there was good and justifying reasons that I had, right? Or take a surgeon, for example, right? Surgeons do awful things to us. (laughs) <laughs> right, they, they cut people open. I mean, there's a little graphic, sorry, but they cut people open. They remove body parts. I mean, it's, it's pretty extreme if you think about it. Are they evil? Well, if they did that on the street, <laughs> if they did that to their, you know, noisy neighbor, like, may, yeah, right, of course. But when they're in the surgery room, when they're in the operating room, they have good and justifying reasons for doing some very extreme things. And imagine this, right? In many cases, it's because that person's life depends upon it, right? They need to have that sort of, if in a sense, harm done to their bodies in order to live. They need that body part out and so on. Uh, right, but the surgeon has good and justifying reasons, and I want to suggest to you that God always has good and justifying reasons for every single thing that we go through, right? What are those good reasons? Well, that's the big task, and that's what we won't be able to get fully done, though I think Madison said I have two hours to preach. Was that what I heard? Okay, good, Um, right? A couple hours, I think is what he said. No, but we won't be able to sort of, and, and the reality is we won't know We won't know many times what God's good and justifying reasons are, but what I want to, the the task that I have, the argument that I want to make is that we can know that God does have those reasons, even if we don't ever know what those are, right? Now, but we can we can flesh some of this out. So, so what are some of the reasons? Well, I think it's it's you, (laughs) and I think it's me. I think God's one reason why really bad things happen is because God wanted us around, right? And he wanted us in a particular way. God didn't create mere robots, um, right? He created free people on my view. Why did he create free people? Well, because he wanted people in which he could have a genuine, you with me, genuine love relationship. Because at the end of the day, forced love Forced love is not love at all. Forced worship, by the way, I don't think is worship at all. So God could eliminate all evil, pain, and suffering, but here's the bad news. That means eliminating, right, you and me. Uh, At least the kind of life that we enjoy, the life of moral significance and freedom. Okay, but now that's just all the kind of philosophical reasons, right? And we can spend a lot of time there. I'm happy to, in our, in our time later, in our panel, uh, happy to go deeper into those things. But I really want to spend some time in Romans 8 and see how to think about, how to, how to face down um, events in our lives of, of trials, of pain, and suffering. So if you would, open up to Romans 8. And I think what we see here are three biblical truths for facing uh, suffering and, and so on. Right? And it all has that backdrop, all has that backdrop of God's having good and justifying reasons and that the way we face this down is to cling to the reality of God, cling to the goodness uh, and theirness of God. Right, God is there. God, as we all see, God is near. So again, the Bible doesn't deny evil. I mean, that's that's the amazing thing. Like this is, if you can't really read this book without seeing, you know, evil, uh, the evil of mankind. I mean, it's chapter three of Genesis that we get a, a an account of the fall of humanity. 
Um, it comes at the very beginning of the book and it frames much of what we experience. So the first biblical truth that I think we need to keep in mind as we face trials in life is one that we live in a fallen world. It is a fallen world. It is a post-Genesis 3 world. It's a world in which, uh, as we'll see in Romans 8 here, right, it's, it's groaning. It's in this place of anticipation for the, for the future. Um, I'm going to start in, in um, 18, actually. Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory, right? God's, God's reasons, his justification that is going to be revealed to us. 19, for the creation, right, this world in which we live eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay, right? That's our current state is a bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's Children, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Right now, this I really think <laughs> is a theological game changer. What I'm about to say, um, God, here, here it comes. Ready? God is under no obligation to make our lives pleasurable. That's right. Now. We all will say, oh, of course, you know, if you're asked that, does God, you'd say no. But so much of us, and I'm talking about me, and I'm talking about you, and I'm talking about all of us, we often think that God owes us a decent life. God owes us some comfort and ease. I mean, we're living our lives for him after all, right? He should clear the way. We should have this wonderful, enjoyable life. But I'm here to let you know this is a hard truth, but in this fallen world, God is under no obligation, not an ounce of obligation, to make your life more comfortable or more pleasurable. Right? This is really what we would might be called the prosperity gospel, right? This is this theological view. Now, there's the pro prosperity gospel that you might see on TV, right? It often involves somebody with kind of a fake tan and a bad haircut or, you know, bad, bad hair kind of thing. And they're asking you to send in a thousand dollars and then you're going to get tenfold or whatever the case may be, right? You're going to get health, you're going to get wealth, and I guess you get a private jet. I don't know. I don't know how it works, but uh, sounds good maybe, but it just happens to be false, right? That is the prosperity gospel, and we rightfully come against that, thinking biblically, right? Uh, thinking biblically and just looking around the world, um, it's very hard to come to grips with this idea. I mean, that might work in, you know, middle America, uh, right, high-income uh, America, but that doesn't work in other parts of the world. It, it falls quite flat. But here's the reality, right? I think... When we think that God owes us some ease and delight in the world, we are, are that's a prosperity gospel too, right? It just doesn't have quite the fanfare that the, the, the other one does, but that's the prosperity gospel. Um, and I really think, I was really tempted to make the entire book of Job our, our passage for today, uh, our text for today, because I really think the book of Job is the critique of any notion, any version of the prosperity gospel. So let me just talk through a little bit because I think this is just so powerful. Right, so, and again, this is probably familiar to many of us that Job was this upright man. He was righteous. Uh, Job 1 1 says he had complete integrity. He feared God. He turned away from evil. But as we know, right, Job 1 and 2, Satan uh, comes before God and requests, you know, says the only reason why Job's living this upright life is because he's got everything. Uh, his life is amazing. Take away those things and he'll curse you. And God says, okay. Does that not already fly in the face of a kind of prosperity gospel in every sense? It seems to me God says, okay, and allows Satan basically to brutalize uh, Job, uh, to take away everything except for his life, his kids, um, his, his livelihood, and his health. 
The only thing that remains is his life. So then Job in his misery has these, let's call them friends, uh, who come and try to convince him that he must have done something wrong, right? Great friends in in your time of need uh, telling you that you've done something wrong. And Job keeps arguing. This is like 36 chapters long, uh, right? They, They argue back and forth and Job continues to maintain his innocence but then questions God's justice, right? Questions God's justice. What in the world's going on here? Well, both, I would suggest, Job's friends and Job himself have a kind of prosperity gospel in a way of thinking that if you live your life well, then you'll get good things. If you live your life poorly, if there's some sin in your life, then you'll get bad things. Job clearly has bad things in his life, so therefore, he must have done something wrong. That's his friend's thinking. But Job's saying, I haven't done anything wrong. Therefore, he thinks God must not be just. He's got the same, right, uh, theological view here. And then in verse, uh, sorry, in uh, chapter 38, God shows up in the whirlwind. So if, I don't know if you've ever read through the book of Job, but it's, it's a beating, <laughs> uh, which is sort of, I think, on purpose, it's diff- what I mean is it's difficult. You get through these 36 chapters over and over and over and over and over and over and again. I mean, it's about the problem of evil. You kind of suffer through the 36 chapters. Okay. Um, and then you get to chapter 38 and God shows up and it's this wonderful, amazing moment having gone through all that. And you know what God doesn't do? He doesn't answer one of Job's questions. Not one. <laughs> Right? And the reality is, we know more about Job's situation because we have Job chapters one and two, knowing what's going on in the back, behind the scenes. Right? Job doesn't presumably know any of that, and he never gets the answers that he's asking for 36 chapters. What does he get, though? Here's the lesson of Job. He finds out that God is indeed there. He finds out that God is indeed good. And he finds out that God is indeed in control. He indeed has a purpose, right? He is indeed sovereign over everything that Job has gone through, right? And there is a purpose for it. What is that purpose? Job doesn't know, but he knows that God is there. And that's such a powerful point that we all need to grasp is to say, we will often not get our why questions answered, and you probably wouldn't want to. I'm not sure it would be good for Job to know what happened in the, uh, you know, behind the scenes kind of a thing. How would that help him at all? I'm not sure it would. What he just needs to know is God's there, that God's good and that he's in control. And that's it. That really is it. And he can face down all of what he confronts in his life. I think when we have people in our lives who go through difficulty, I think we need to be really quick to say, and they say, why is this happening? I think that we need to be really quick to say, I don't know. I really don't know. We we need to be quick to not try to solve the problem of evil when people are going through uh, tragedy. And just say, I don't know, but I'm gonna stick here right by your side, right? I'm gonna be with you. I'm gonna put my arm around you. I'm gonna love you no matter what. Right, We need to say, I don't know. Point two, though, is that God, a biblical truth is that God is present with us in our suffering, (laughs) right? God is present with us in our suffering. So verse 26, Romans 8, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. There's a lot of groaning in this passage. I don't know if you picked up on that when Madison read through, but there's a lot of groaning. Creation's groaning. Uh, There's the groaning of of humans, verse 23. Uh, But those are groanings of suffering, right? The groaning of the Spirit is intercessory. The groaning of the Spirit is the right kind of view, Uh, right? He is groaning, Uh, in in, in interceding for us and helping us through the time that we go through, right? God is there for us. I mean, that's, again, the lesson of Job is God is there. Um, 
So my wife, my beautiful wife, who's here with me today, um, tragically lost her mom. I never got to meet her. Um, this is 25 or so years ago now. Um, and by all accounts, she was an angel. I don't know, probably that's bad theology, but by all accounts, she was like an angel. How about that? Um, right, everybody, everybody that I've, I've met has said she was just, you know, that kind of person. Um, and it was tragic. The whole town was rocked by this. Their whole church was rocked by this and so on. And uh, one time I asked my father-in-law, Sherry's dad, I asked him, did that ever cause you to like doubt God? Like was, was that kind of suffering, that kind of problem of evil, like was that ever for you um, something that led you to wonder if God is even there? His response was, no way, <laughs> no way. He said, I couldn't have gotten through it without clinging to the reality of God. Amen. Right? It didn't, for him, I mean, he asked the why questions. He said he, 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 for a little while there, he was asking, like, why our family and not these other fam? Like, you know, he, he kind of started down that why question path, but he quickly realized that was pointless. Um, for him, God was there. God was in control. <laughs> Um, God, God was good, and God is what got him through that. And I just think that that's it. God is there for us in our suffering. Now, I think I think that there will be some that will say, "I went through a really difficult time, and God wasn't there." I think people will say that, but I wonder if they had eyes to see and ears to hear, because I think this is what we do. We go through this difficult time, and we say, "All right, God, I need you to show up." I need like angels to appear and lightning strikes and all this fanfare and so on. I need you to show up in this way. And then of course he doesn't. And they say, oh, God's just absent to us. Uh, I think what might also be a kind of game-changing theological view is that we need to approach God on his terms, not our terms, right? We don't set the agenda. We don't set what it looks like for God to be there for us. Here's the reality is God is there. God is there. Uh, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know if I wanted to flip to this, but if you would flip to Acts 17, if you're following along, I just thought this, this is it, man. Now, Paul's not necessarily talking about suffering. Verse 26, Acts 17, verse 26. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so, guess here it comes, that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Right, I think God is there. He is there. Like I want you to hear that this morning, that God is there. You can find him in your suffering. He is there, but it's not on your terms. It is on God's terms. And you, he's, he's near, right? You can find him. And I think God will do something big. I really do. And I say that in part because so many accounts of people who have pressed into the reality of God in those very difficult times, uh, my father-in-law included, right? And God does something big in our lives, um, right? He wants every part of us. And when, we're, when, we're ex when life is pretty great, we tend to make God an afterthought, don't we? Don't we all do that in some way or another? Like when life is really good, we tend to forget the reality of God. And then when life gets difficult, what do we do? We're sort of driven to our knees. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. He says, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain is, insists upon being attended to. Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf 
world. Um, the reality is, right, if we'll turn to God, he will do a big thing in our suffering. Um, and we often don't realize that until we get into those times of difficulty and suffering. Okay, biblical truth number three is that we have a great hope. And here's the good news, right? We have a great hope. Verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Right? There's a good end to this story. There's an amazing end to this story. Verse 23, not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we, are, we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope because, he, uh, because who hopes for what he sees now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for him with patience, right? If it was just right there, we wouldn't put our hope and our trust and our expectation in the Lord. And that's what he wants, <laughs> right? He's not, again, the point is not to bless your life with every material blessing that he could possibly do. Because guess what we would do? We would ignore God. Right. The point is that we would hope and trust and rely and depend and a great teacher in this is our suffering. Right? It's the story of redemption. Um, and here's the, here's the good news, verse 28. We, many of us have memorized this before, but understand this in its context. Uh, Paul says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. Now, he's not saying it's going to be pleasant. The good... Right? He's, gonna, he's saying it's good, though. Right? What, what God is doing is, is bringing to a place of good, and it's good for you, and it's good for me. But it may not be ple- that, that path may not be pleasant. This is not prosperity gospel at all. It's just saying that God is working for your good. Now, how do we reconcile that with the craziness of what we might experience? That's what I'm saying. I think that's a, that's a road that's probably not worth going down. Try to reconcile these things. It's clinging to the reality that God is there, that God is good, and that God is in control, and that God is working for our good. Amen. Right? That's the framing. That's the framing. That's the context. That's the biblical way. That's the theology we need in order to face down whatever it is we we face, right? And that's super easy to say. I, I'll just be honest about that. It's, all of this is easy to say, right? But it comes down to it where we have to be grounded in that reality, I think. The grounded in the reality. And, and it's really uh, humbling in a way, right? Because we kind of want to know the why. We kind of want to know all the answers. We kind of want to be able to explain all these things. But I'm, I, we just don't need to. What we need is to know that God is there, that God is good, and that he's in control, right? So how do we face suffering? Uh, it's knowing of the nearness of God. It's knowing of the reality of God. Could he take away our suffering in an instant? Yes. And might he? Yes. But might he not? Absolutely yes, too, right? Uh, we, we will, we're not promised a, a pleasant and life of ease and delight at all. And oftentimes that's not his plan, right? It's part, I mean, it's hard to understand, but it's part of his plan for us to go through what we do. But all the while, you can know he's there. He's right there, guys. He's right there. And he wants us to find him in that. Uh, We need to know that God is there, that he's good, that he's in control, and cling to that reality as we face down those difficult times. I just want to read Philippians 4 as a closing to the message. Um, Maybe close your eyes, especially if you're going through it right now, if you're going through difficulty. Um, Again, these these are words are easy to say when you're not, but I I think they might be life-giving when you are. So so let me just read for you Philippians 4, and then I'm going to pray. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. Why? The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. (laughs) 
But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. The Lord is near. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Father, um, it's so easy to say. And God, I pray for those that are here this morning that um, are, are going through it. And God, I pray that they would find you in that. Pray that they're, um, they would find life in their deepest and darkest moments. And God, I pray for those that are struggling with this idea of how can there be an all good, all powerful God when, when there's so much pain and suffering and war, and poverty, and disease. God, I pray that we would have a big theology, a big view of you to realize that you are in control of all these things and we're like the kids that don't understand why we can't, you know, have candy for dinner. <laughs> We're, we're the kid that don't, don't understand what our parents are doing and can't understand, but we need to trust. We need to understand that you do have purpose. You do have good and justifying reasons. And so God, we trust you, God. May we trust you this morning to know that you are doing a work, even if we never even live to see that work. God, we love you and we thank you. I thank you for this church. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Do you stand with us as we respond to God's word together?
what the future brings. I will watch and wait for the Savior King. Then my joy complete, standing face to face in the presence of the Ancient of Days. Well, amen. I love that title, The Ancient of Days. That is the God that we serve. And uh, I'm so glad that you've joined us for worship today. If we can help you take your next step, we would love to do that, to talk to you about baptism or how to belong or even about finding salvation in Jesus. We would love to talk with you after our service at the Next Steps Corner. And just as a reminder, as we prepare to go out, we do not have our normal life groups for fifth grade and up and our adults. We're going to continue our discussion on the problem of evil in our gym. So fifth grade and up, we'll have that time together with a panel discussion with Dr. Dickinson. Fourth grade and under, we'll have their normal life groups. But as we prepare to go out, let me read John 20, 19 through 21, as we're reminded of our mission together. When it was evening on the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood amongst them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Go in the power and the peace and the presence of God. You're dismissed.